Kathy McAfee, Kathy McAfee, I teach at San Francisco State. The question is, is California really a climate model for the world? I mean, we are the number four oil state in the U.S. We are fracking, we're producing fossil fuels, we're importing fossil fuels, including this filthy tar sands bitumen from Canada. We're uh, exporting fossil fuels. Uh, and we may be actually increasing our contribution to global warming, even as in the state we are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions slightly. So Adam is going to talk about uh, some of that. Am I right, Adam? Okay. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about whether or not we are meeting our goal. You may have seen some headlines saying, California meets climate goal four years early. Um, the present policy uh, is pretty good, but it's far from enough. And I, what I'm going to argue is that it's based on the illusion that we can use capitalist methods to save the world from the consequences of capitalism. Um, and cap and trade and offsets are two of these market-based, so-called market-based parts of California policy that the polluting industries have come to love because it makes it really cheap and easy for them to continue emitting greenhouse gases. And this is what I'll talk about. Uh, and then uh, we're really lucky to have Rabia Sen to uh, be with us today. And uh, we're really unlucky that her name didn't get put on the program. Uh, because our, our other speaker had a last minute uh, conflict. And, but we're really lucky because Rabia has come up the whole way from South Central LA, where she's the policy director for Esperanza Community Housing. Housing? Huh? What's that? Well, you, as, as she will explain, you really can't separate these issues of uh, housing, uh, especially for people of color uh, and low income people and some of the other areas that she has expertise in, such as domestic violence. So she will show us something about um, how, this is, how this is all related to cap and trade. Uh, now, polluting industries and some of the non-government uh, organizations, the big conservationist organizations uh, that are very well funded, they have a big interest in offsets. In fact, they're pushing for even more offsets from uh, California, in California's climate policy, so that polluters can keep emitting greenhouse gases if they pay for some uh, green project somewhere else by somebody else, even in countries like Brazil or Mexico or Indonesia. And this is a, a big push. Uh, that's what we're gonna see on the agenda for state uh, climate policy in this, this fall. Uh, and Tracy is going to talk about, she really knows the impacts of offsetting uh, in forest carbon offsets because she's studied that and she's been there and she knows what she's talking about and she's going to talk about how offsetting is adding to environmental injustice in Latin America and other parts of the world that are already experiencing the worst effects of global warming. So let me turn it over to Adam and uh, here we go. I'm the California Director with Food and Water Watch. Very happy to be back at Soil Not Oil. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, fossil fuel extraction in California. Some of you probably already know what's going on. We've been uh, fighting this here in the state for about five, six years. It's funny, uh, our organization, Food and Water Watch National Organization, first took on fracking uh, in the gas industry in the East Coast, uh, in New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia when we heard about um, this term fracking uh, for natural gas in the Marcellus Shale. And it was funny, when we heard about that in California, we weren't quite working on those issues yet, and we said, fracking, what the heck is that? And uh, it turns out, we'd already been doing it here. Uh, we forget sometimes in the area that California is a major oil state, um, that Kern County in the bottom end of the Central Valley produces about 10% of the nation's oil crude, uh, Los Angeles historically is oil fields. Ventura County is the site and story of the movie There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis. And Santa Barbara County 
uh, not only has major offshore operations and was cited with one of the most famous oil spills in the world's history in 1969, but uh, to this day has over uh, about 700 active oil wells hidden behind uh, the hills of wine country in Santa Barbara County. And there's actually proposals to put another 1,000 oil wells onshore in Santa Barbara County that we are actively fighting. Um, so about five years ago, we heard that uh, there was interest in a, a fracking boom and expansion in California, moving north of that central coast into Monterey, uh, San Benito, Santa Cruz counties, and even a little bit for natural gas extraction in, in the northern part of the state, Butte County, around there. And so we said, well, we can't have that. Um, we gotta, we got to help fight that. And uh, it's been a heck of a battle. Um, while we eventually got Governor Cuomo the governor of New York to ban fracking after a six-year campaign of a major win. Thank you. Um, a lot of um, a quick uh, political view of California says, well, California is so progressive and is a climate leader, of course, California is going to ban fracking too, right? Um, and this governor, Jerry Brown, has mostly uh, made excuses for the oil and gas industry he blames us for driving cars, even though why he supports the transition to electric cars, for allowing fracking to continue, and uh, has actually helped allow them to write our climate policy, including the cap and trade pro program extension he ran through last year, even though the environmental justice community was united against it, and California's leading environmental groups were also united against it. So, Given that uh, challenge, uh, the movement has really been focused on the local level, of city and county level. So far, we've banned fracking in six counties in California. The last one was in Monterey County in 2016, where the community rose up and be shut down. <laughs> that fight continues this year in San Luis Obispo County, uh, where we are going to be taking on the oil industry, working to pass Measure G on the November ballot. Uh, we will be taking on a project, uh, just working to stop a project of 400 new oil wells near Avila Beach. Now, some of you may know Slow County, some of you may not, but they've had incredibly toxic experiences with the oil industry. They've actually had to relocate the entire town, uh, the town of Avila Beach, after one of the nation's most toxic oil spills that were, was coming out in the groundwater into the beach. Uh, so this is what they want to do again in that county, and we need to stop them. I mentioned what's going on in Santa Barbara, also in Ventura County. There are plans to put 300 new oil wells in what's called the Ventura Tar Sands near the community of Oxnard, California, which suffers very disproportionately from pollution from not only uh, fracking oil wells and power plants. And then in Los Angeles, we have drilling in people's backyards. Uh, 700 active oil wells in the city of Los Angeles and over 5,000 active oil wells in the county of Los Angeles. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, it is our hope that as we build this movement, as we get more and more local victories, that that will start to translate into a, an inevitability that we can do this on a statewide level, and probably most certainly with a new governor, Governor Newsom. He may not know that he's planning to do this, but we have to make him do it. Um, this is gonna be our, our job. As a I wanted to say something because uh, we're here before this uh, climate summit this week uh, that Jerry Brown is hosting uh, here uh, at the Moscone Center starting on Thursday. And um, you also probably heard that Governor Brown did sign Kevin DeLeon's SB 100 yesterday to put California on a path to 100% renewable by 2045. That's a good step. We would like to see it more soon, sooner. Uh, we don't think, it's our opinion at Food and Water Watch, we don't have 27 years to get to 100%, but we agree it's a good step. And so we want to thank Kevin DeLeon for his work on that. But one narrative we hear is that, well, the assumption is, oh, well, we're going out of renewable energy. Obviously, that's, that's a, a one to one offset uh, from fossil fuels, right? As we're increasing our renewable energy, we're just decreasing our fossil fuels. Actually, that's not happening in California, in part uh, because we have uh, oil on an international market. We've seen reports that more and more oil being drilled in California is being exported, even as we're importing it from the tar sands in Canada, refineries are now starting to export oil um, more to Asia and other overseas markets. And then we're also seeing that we are, our energy grid is chock full of dirty gas and coal, much of which is imported from uh, states like Utah, Arizona, and Colorado. And 
Um, this year, there was a dangerous proposal, actually, that was defeated by a lot of you in the room and the people over the state that would have privatized and merged our energy grid with other states across the West, giving more power to those states, giving more power to the Trump administration. Uh, and this was a plan that was being pushed by Governor Brown, of all people, uh, with some of his environmental groups, and it was defeated this year in the legislature. It was a very good thing. So California retains control. So now we have to fight to change the government and get our elected officials to mandate the real clean energy that we want in this state. Um, just a little side note about the big dairies in the Central Valley, where I'm originally from, a huge methane spot. Currently, the dairy industry is working with the gas industry, led by Sempra Energy, SoCal Gas in Southern California. Sempra Energy is a huge gas utility. Jerry Brown's sister sits on the board of that company, has been paid a million dollars just to sit on the board. They are working to push and greenwash gas from uh, massive dairies in the Central Valley. Now, these dairies are bigger beyond belief. If you ever get the chance to drive down there, we're talking 10,000, 20,000 cows, massive groundwater pollution, air pollution, toxic community effects. Well, what's, your, what's the solution? Reducing the, hello, reducing the herd size, spreading the animals out, reducing the operations. That's the only way to start to, to clean up the effects of these dairies. Of course, we can't, you know, our, our opponents attack us like we're crazy. Instead, they want us to subsidize all of the gas that's being produced there, build pipelines from the Central Valley to Los Angeles so we can put more gas and keep the, hook, the state hooked on gas. And right now, the state's renewable portfolio standard, uh, the definition of renewable energy accommodates what's this biogas. And so follow-up legislation is needed to clean up our renewable portfolio standards so that we're only including truly renewable sources, solar, wind, um, uh, you stand out. Use it for a little bit of geothermal, maybe a little tile. You got with truly renewable sources. So this is what we have to look forward to, and I'm, I'm excited to see that we have some great candidates uh, running on these issues who agree with us. Obviously, in the East Bay, we're very excited about Javanka Beckles. Food and, uh, food, and water, uh, food and Water Action, our political PAC arm of Food and Water Watch, will be endorsing her, as well as Robert Rebus is going to be a progressive elected from the Salinas Valley, who is defeating the oil industry. They went after him to make an example of him, and we're going to kick their butt. Uh, they, they dropped $400,000 on attack ads, and he won with over 50% of the vote, and he's going to win this November, so that's exciting. So the point I'm trying to make here, though, is that we have to, we have to get control of this at the government level. Right now, the state regulatory apparatus has been captured by these industries. They largely work for them. That includes the California Air Resources Board. The only way to do it is to get our people elected to put massive pressure on the governor to turn this around. It's not going to happen. The market is not going to make it happen on its own. We are challenging monopoly corporate power, and the only way to do that is to get control of our government. Thank you very much. As Adam has already explained, uh, our total contribution to global warming may be increasing, given all the exporting uh, of fossil fuels. Uh, our goal of 40% reduction by 2030 is it's good, but it's not nearly good enough, as I think you all know. Um, how can we get there, though? Can we get there? No, maybe. Um, but we certainly can't get there through market-based policies. Because what we're seeing now is that the market-based policies, such as cap and trade and offsets, are delaying greenhouse gas re reductions. Um, and they're, all, they're really there. I mean, you look at the documents, you look at the legislation, you look at the debates and hearings, you can really see that their main purpose of being there is to protect the energy industry profits. Um, cap and trade and offsets, as Rabia will explain, are making environmental injustice worse. But there really are alternatives. So I hope I get that far. So but I just kind of squeeze in a little bit of data here. Um, now, you already know uh, about Jerry Brown's uh, proclamations of leadership, and you also know how Jerry Brown has different messages uh, for, say, the Pope uh, than he has for uh, protesters. Um, but what are, yeah, whoops, why is this clicker not, okay, uh, I guess I have to aim it somewhere. All right, uh, and, but what I've been zooming in on 
is the way that California's climate policy has been depicted as, as it says here, a beacon of success for market-based environmentalism. And I just happened to, there were thousands of articles I could have chosen. I just pulled this one out of an international law review. Um, so what we're seeing um, is a, an embrace of cap and trade as the way forward. No intrusive command and control which is, as you might know, that's kind of right wing speak for government policy, command and control, terrible thing. Um, Brown has said in an interview that our goal is to have a worldwide carbon trading system, and that's very much what the carbon investment community is looking for. Uh, and this is one of the things I've done my own academic research on. Um, but yet, yeah, uh, we see California slashing emissions hits major greenhouse gas goals early. Well, is that true? And how did that come about? Was it through cap and trade? So I'm going to put a little data up here. So as you know, um, there is this limit. Uh, the, the policy, the original policy in the climate law was to reduce uh, global warming to 1990 levels by 2020. And if you look at the uh, publicity about this, it might look like that's actually happening. Of course, a lot of the, the emissions reductions were a result of recession. But after 2015, you see this decrease, and this is what all the cheering has, has been about. So um, how is this achieved? Was it achieved by cap and trade? Well, let's look. You probably know this, but let's just look a little closer. Um, and we can see that there have actually been increases in some sectors and all the other sectors, except there for other sources, um, have had small increases in greenhouse gas emissions, but the electricity sector in this one period um, had significant decreases. But this was not a result of cap and trade. It was a result of rain. Remember, <laughs> year before last, all the heavy rain we had? Uh, and this enabled the um, electricity generators to use a lot more hydropower, obviously less damaging, and that's how we achieved those uh, rapid, more rapid reductions. But let's look at where we have to go, where we're claiming we're going to go, uh, where we need to go. Um, take this out to the new goal that was adopted in the last year, uh, and you can see that our reductions are going to have to go down by a lot steeper curve if we are ever going to meet the goal that we have now. So uh, that's where we have to get to. So we need something more, something different than the policy uh, uh, mix that we have right now. Um, so one of the issues here is that the cap and trade was set uh, in a way that really allowed the major polluters to continue doing their thing and to do it profitably. So this shows you that the cap, this is the level that the state says is okay to have emissions. Well, the industry only, quote, needed this many permits. They had, and most of these were given for free, very, very few for were sold. Um, and as a result of there being way too many free and cheap permits, investors are banking these and speculating on these. Uh, it's not clear whether they'll be used. But the, the basic thing is that the cost of polluting has been set way too low to really cause polluters to change their practices in significant ways. Okay, I'll leave that on there, people like it. <laughs> okay, um, so, and, and one of the things though that I'm not sure people realize, there's so much rhetoric, uh, econo-speak, and I teach political economy, and I understand the arguments about cost containment and efficiency, uh, the very narrowly based economic arguments, that look at the economy as a whole separate thing from nature and society. I understand that. But if you really look at the documents and the process, and you know, one of the people who looked at it was one of my colleagues, um, who talked about how really it's not the market that's setting the prices. It's really an agreement between the government and the oil companies and the government and the other industry uh, interests. So, and who are they? Well, um, here's a, a list of the suspects. Um, and you see, um, well, I don't think I have time to, to say anything more about that. I'm going to run out of time. Um, but I think you probably
probably are aware that the role, can you even see that? The red is kind of fading out here. Oil companies spent $2.5 million in lobbying just during the negotiations last summer. Looking at the Red Plus projects, and uh, I've published about the international carbon trading. So, uh, but we have got a, a fight on our hands because um, some of the mainstream market-oriented conservationists are pushing for increased offsets that would allow companies to pay farmers in Brazil or somewhere, uh, or pay the government in Acre uh, to, uh, to manage forestry there so that companies in California can keep emitting pollutants. Uh, so we've got a, a fight on our hands this fall about that. Um, then we can begin to really outlaw greenhouse gas emissions. We need to begin to decommission refineries. We need to phase them out. We basically need to nationalize the fossil fuel stores under our waters and our land. Um, we need to make public utilities publicly owned. And we need huge public investments in infrastructure reconstruction. Right. It's got to be totally reimagined and reconstructed, but it can be done. And this is what, I, I mean, I teach environmental studies and global food and hunger and political economy. This is what students are really excited about. They, you know, the technology's there, but uh, it's getting there but we've got to put it into effect. Well, this is not Jerry Brown's idea. In fact, he said in an interview not that long ago that the kind of uh, opposition that he's been getting, those of us who've been calling for stronger policies, is a form of political terrorism conspiring to undermine the American system of government. Um, and you all know about let's put you in the ground. Well, I don't know, all I can say is if that is I don't know if we're undermining American system of governance, but if the system of governance we have now is giving us the results that we're getting now, maybe we need to transform it. And uh, that's what a lot of people are working on, and I'm pretty excited about that. That's it. I'm here to talk about the experience that we're having down in Los Angeles, in particular in South Central Los Angeles, um, when it comes to the oil industry. Um, so I am with Esperanza Community Housing, and we are located in South Central LA. And we originally began um, as a provider of affordable housing in South Central, given the, the gentrification and displacement um, that began and continues to occur. Um, with that, what we're realizing with our tenants as we continue organizing with tenants is that it's not simply enough to provide affordable housing. We need to make sure that the neighborhoods in which they live um, are, are healthy neighborhoods, that there are um, 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 adequate protections for all the residents and for tenants, that there are anti-displacement measures in place, that there's access to health resources, and that the air that they live and breathe in is clean. So before I go into that, what, what I'd like to do is just give you a short history of, of what the neighborhood has experienced um, over at least the last 100 years in Los Angeles. So I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but while LA is notorious for its freeways and its cars, um, it, it actually used to have quite a robust public transit system in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so this is what happened with that. If, I, I, I guess I'll just start in the 1950s or so in South Central, right? So we have this really wonderful robust transit system. Um, South Central Los Angeles actually had farms, um, in, including dairy farms. Um, so a whole bunch of things started happening that were seemingly disparate, but that actually um, seemed to be the perfect storm and conspiracy to hurt the health of people living in South Central LA. Um, and so what happened is this. Eventually, the city planning department started um, taking away the zoning permits for the farming and the agriculture, saying that it was actually harming the health of residents there. Simultaneous to doing this, they were actually then granting permits for more, for, for more oil extraction in those very neighborhoods. While that was happening, the city of LA 
decided to privatize its public transit system, which was taken over by GM, who eventually ran the public transit system into the ground while increasing their own profits um, by selling more automobiles. In the meanwhile, the city of LA kept expanding into the suburbs and decided that they needed to find ways for people living in suburbs to access their jobs in the city. And so the city planning department then came up with the freeway system. The freeway system, I don't know how many of you are from LA or are familiar with LA, but when you see I-10, right, that ends basically at the beach in Santa Monica, they basically took the I-10 freeway and used it to bifurcate the communities in South Central Los Angeles and in East Los Angeles. So they're destroying the stock of healthy, affordable housing. They're um, increasing the, the roadways and therefore the carbon emissions that these communities are going to be um, experiencing. And it's not just the I-10 freeway running east-west, it's also the 110 freeway running north-south. Um, so these, all, all these freeways, if, if, if you look at pictures of Los Angeles and you see some of the very typical images of these passovers and freeways all intersecting with each other, those intersections are all happening in the poorest communities that are overwhelmingly communities of color. And so when you look at the history of what city planning and zoning has been like in Los Angeles, what land use planning has been like in Los Angeles, it has been the perfect storm, the perfect conspiracy that is harming the health of our most vulnerable communities in order to make it easier for other communities who are not experiencing these cumulative harms. And this is why we say that environmental justice is in fact racial justice. At, at Esperanza, this is what we've seen. So I'm sure you're familiar. Um, LA is one of the largest urban oil fields. And, and just to kind of underline this um, with, with what we just heard, the cap and trade um, um, uh, policies are fundamentally flawed precisely because of, well, many things, but also because they seem to exclude the fossil fuel industry. I'm not sure how you address climate change and global warming and the health of all our communities if we are going to exempt one of the worst polluters and people who harm the health of our communities. So I just want to put that out there. Now, this is what's happening right with Esperanza, with the communities whom we serve. Back in 2009, we started getting... Um, a lot of complaints from our tenants, from other neighbors, and from our employees who also live in the neighborhood of nauseous smells. Pretty soon they started talking about all these um, very acute health issues that they were having, including nosebleeds, um, onset of asthma, other, um, um, other issues around respiratory just, um, 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 uh, distress. We heard from parents who were taking increased time off work um, because they were staying up through the night to watch over their children. Who, these spontaneous nosebleeds weren't just a small thing. These were puddles of blood that were coming. And this is what we were hearing, and none of us knew what was going on. And then quite by accident, we found out that right across the street from three of our buildings, um, there was this beige-walled enclosure and what we found out, they left the gates open one day quite by accident and invited one of her employees and her daughter who were walking past. They said, hey, why don't you come in and see what we're doing here? And that's how we found out that mere feet from schools, from homes, from parks, the fossil fuel industry was conducting oil extraction activities. Between 2009 and 2010, this company, by the way, is called Allen Co., and Allen Co., by the way, leases its land from the LA Archdiocese, who uh, seems to make a habit of leasing to the fossil fuel industry in South Central. Allen Co. is not the only site. Um, so between 2009 and 2010, Allen Co. increased its production by over 400%. So you can imagine what was happening. Here's the problem with policies that are market-based. None of the agencies, city, county, state, who one would think 
would want to protect the health of the communities. None of them said that they could. They all said their hands were tied because there's only so much they could regulate. So from 2009 to 2013, it's the community, this community experiencing cumulative harms from the market with gentrification, with displacement, with lack of access to healthcare, with attacks on the immigrant communities, with the criminalization of black and brown bodies, with the criminalization of homelessness. These communities continue to organize. And at Esperanza, we, we formed a group called People Not Bozos, People Not Oil Wells. And because this community uplifted and created so much publicity, the media started hearing about it, and then Senator Barbara Boxer heard about it, and she got USCPA involved. And when they came and they decided to tour the facility with USCPA and people from LA County um, um, uh, Public Health, as they toured the Allen Co. facility itself, they fell sick. So almost four years after the community started complaining about this, Peter Allen, the owner of Allen Co., announced that Allen Co. had voluntarily shut down. So this was November 2013. We're almost five years later. In these ensuing five years, we have seen a 60% decrease in pollutants in that area. However, we have also heard, and this is why monitoring, mitigation, regulation just won't work. I see I'm at time, can I have about a minute more? Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and this is why it won't work, because we are hearing, and the community has heard, that Allen Co. says they have complied with almost everything all the regulatory agencies have asked of them, and that they may reopen soon. This is why cap and trade doesn't work. Since Governor Brown became governor in, in, in 2011, the, 77% of all new oil and gas permits have been concentrated in EJ communities. Those communities have actually seen an increase in emissions, not a decrease. To say that we will tackle climate change by concentrating pollution, moving it around, but really moving it around to concentrate it in certain communities and make those communities sacrifice zones just so that these other communities have pristine air is an absolute contradiction. So here we are at Esperanza with our building, one of our buildings right across the street from Esperanza, which benefited from AB 32, one of the cap and trade policies. Um, but we, we actually now operate all on solar energy. We have, solar, we, we have the panels on top of that building. But the problem here is that while we have switched to clean energy, we, we have merely to look across the street to Allen Co. that apparently is still going to be allowed to poison our communities. In fact, just this past summer, while trying to comply with regulations, the um, Allen Co. has actually, we have two documented incidents of them poisoning the community as they've, they've conducted tests. And this is just about conducting tests. This is not about operating. So anyway, I, I, I know time is up, so I'll stop right here. But if anything, we have the examples right here in our backyard. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Tracy Osborne. And um, first, I'd, I'd just like to recognize um, that we're on Ohlone land, um, the indigenous, the in, original inhabitants of this land. Um, indigenous peoples for, um, you know, for generations, generations, for hundreds and thousands of years have been the caretakers and the stewards of land, water, and forests. Indigenous peoples, um, many of whom I work with it, across the Americas, have also been um, at the forefront of the movement to keep fossil fuels underground. And they've also been um, uh, quite um, vocally I'm concerned uh, about the cap and trade and, and carbon offsets. And so uh, carbon, um, carbon, the carbon market has been um, implemented despite the concerns of you know, people of color and indigenous peoples across, across the, the, the Americas um, because of this assumption that the carbon market will reduce greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions at a lower rate. That it's a cost, of, a cost effective mechanism, finance mechanism for addressing climate change. However, we've heard about some of these 
egregious um, environmental um, impacts, these social environmental justice impacts um, in, uh, in California um, and, and across California, but we've also um, know that there are significant impacts from these carbon offsets in Latin America and places like Mexico where I've done a fair amount of work. So also I just wanna, um, there is a, a really interesting study by um, Laura Cushing and um, colleagues that suggests, that based on some of the, what we've already heard, that in certain cases, we know that certain industries and sectors, there actually have been increases in greenhouse gas emissions, even under the cap and trade. And some of these sectors include fossil fuels, um, the fossil fuel industry and, and refineries. And this means that we're, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing um, increased environmental justice impacts in, in um, places like LA. So I wanna spend a little bit more time um, thinking about some of the impacts of, um, of these carbon offsets in forests. And I spent a lot of time in Chiapas, Mexico, looking at, um, at the, how, the way in which the voluntary carbon market has operated in, in um, small communities, uh, forest communities, and indigenous communities. And over, you know, sort of generally, there's some, some general ways in which carbon markets fail. In, in one, ways, in one way, um, the market treats fossil fuel carbon and forest carbon as if it's the same. But there are very different risks that are associated with these two pools of carbon. Obviously, um, fossil fuel carbon, it's, you know, it's created over hundreds of millions of years, and it will remain underground unless it's extracted and burned. Um, on the other hand, you have forest-based carbon that you know, grows and it remains, the carbon remains stored in, the, in forest carbon over hundreds, you know, maybe thousands of years. But as we've seen with the fires in California, those, that carbon can disappear in a very short period of time. Um, you know, also, even in places like the, the Amazon, the northern Amazon, there were huge fires in uh, the late 1990s. And, so, and we're, we're seeing increased um, fires in, in tropical forests because of sort of the, the, the increased deforestation in those regions, but also some of these drier microclimates. So, in, so, so the fact that it, it treats these two pools of carbon in, in the same way, so that one, you can trade one for, uh, for one another, um, creates a whole set of, of real problems. Another one of the, the issues with carbon markets is that, it, in, in reality, it does not address the main drivers of deforestation. So in the Amazon, for example, some of the main drivers of deforestation are you know, large-scale agriculture for um, for soybeans, for, um, uh, for uh, palm oil, large-scale uh, um, cattle ranching, um, the building of roads, hydroelectric power, um, certainly, certainly logging, large-scale large logging. And these activities are continuing. And in, in, because the market, the prices tend to be quite low and volatile, it's not necessarily addressing some of the, the, the real um, drivers of... of, um, of deforestation and degradation. So on a lo more local scale, carbon, um, carbon projects have also constrained um, forest communities' access to land and resources. Um, they've also provided very minimal compensation. They've also changed traditional forms of land use um, and forest governance in ways that can actually um, reduce rather than enhance carbon in the ecosystem. And so I'll give you a, a, a short, um, a very brief um, uh, example of this based on some of the work in Chiapas. So a small farmer, indigenous farmer, um, asked me, you know, what would be the potential, what would be the possibility of receiving funds for his, you know, for, the, for maintaining his fallow system? As part of the carbon market, um, small farmers, indigenous farmers, were asked to shift their land uses. So traditionally, um, farmers have a, a milpa, so they're planting corn and beans, and uh, you know they clear the land with fire, but they, they the, to be able to release the nutrients in the soil, and then they plant you know corn and beans, and then they leave the land for fallow. In some cases, where I was working, they leave the land for fallow for up to 20 years. However, as part of the carbon market, they started shifting this production 
where instead of leaving the land fallow for 20 years, and, and let me remind you, this is a managed fallow, so it was um, a, it actually a quite lush area with, planted with um, useful fruit trees and other um, medicinal plants. Um, but they were asked to switch that land use to the planting of timber trees, and only two species of timber trees, so mahogany and cedar. So, in, so we were asked to do um, uh, a carbon analysis, and when we, we looked at the sort of the, compared the carbon it stored, sequestered and stored in their traditional fallow system, compared to the timber species that they were planting, and that, that the timber they were allowed to cut after 25 years, we actually found three times the amount of carbon stored in their fallow system compared to the, the carbon system that they were asked to, to, to um, you know, re to replace. Um, and so it really sort of demonstrates some of the failures of the way that the carbon market even operates, um, you know, on the ground. Um, but a, a few weeks ago, I actually was able to spend some time in, with this, in the Sarayaco community of, of Ecuador. And I just want to say a little bit about their living forest proposal. It's called Sarayaco, it, it's, it's called um, Kauzak Sacha, or, or the living forest proposal. And it's a proposal that recognizes that forests are not only living, but they are sacred spaces, and they're inhabited by being seen and unseen. And they have a whole set of rules and regulations that allow them to govern and, and manage those forests. And, it, it's all, it, 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 and these are the types of alternatives, these are the types of projects, and not, it's, it's actually, it's a, a a system. It's a sort of a way of life. It's based on their cosmovision. But these are the, the um, indigenous proposals that we really want to be um, supporting. And the carbon market is not capable of, of doing that. And actually, communities like Sarayaku, a lot of indigenous peoples, like I was mentioning, are, um, are strongly and, uh, and um, um, vehemently against any type of market mechanism. But instead, and, and if California is truly to be a climate leader, it, we have to really think about the climate justice implications. And in doing so, we also have to rethink the carbon market and consider instead a carbon fee and dividend. And so a carbon fee and dividend, you know, the, the, would generate income from a fee, and the dividend could go to low-income communities to offset the cost of that fee, but a portion of that could also provide um, some uh, support for a fund, and that fund could go toward, um, in you know, some of these types of indigenous proposals, these indigenous-led um, climate change mitigation projects and forests. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Some of the cap and trade money here in California has been used to encourage agriculture to put more carbon in the soil. So if we eliminate cap and trade, can you suggest a good source of funding to help farmers convert to better practices? Um, no, I don't have a, a, a particular source of funding. Um, I just want to, I, I, I see your point. I just want to uh, comment that it's, kind, it's totally arbitrary uh, to say, the only funds that we can use for these various green projects, including the important uh, carb agricultural carbon sequestration, uh, the only way we can get those is through cap and trade, through selling permits to pollute. It's arbitrary. I mean, th that connection. Uh, we, uh, state funding comes from many different sources and is used for many different things, and the priorities have to change. But the effect of doing this is a lot to uh, basically co-opt people and to get people competing for projects. It's like the high-speed rail versus uh, housing versus having a green bus in your community versus carbon soil uh, sequestration. We have this little pile of money that we then fight over. Uh, we need to break out of that uh, paradigm. I, I don't have a simple answer for you, but that's the framework. Um. Yeah, I, yeah I just, let me just also add that, I mean, you know, um, our certain agricultural crops are highly subsidized. And so there's state funds that already go to subsidize, subsidize um, a certain form of agriculture. That those subsidies could be redirected 
for those types of more sustainable agroecological forms of agriculture. Yeah, I have a question, um, I guess, for Adam and maybe one for Tracy. Um, I just heard about this New York Times article that the fracking industry really is not, is not making any profits or money, particularly because they're um, borrowing money at 0% interest rates, and, and they're like a Ponzi scheme, essentially. And I just wondered, I believe that's true, um, you can correct me if it's not, and, and how can we use that to um, further their demise very quickly? <laughs> I, I, Trace, Tracy, the only question I had for you was the carbon fee you're suggesting. Does that stop um, the, the um, is it sort of like cap and trade in a sense? Like, like are you still, are they still paying? No, okay, well that's, but, so, so, okay, well, that question, the first one, to Adam, thanks. Sure, sure. Um, so the question about um, the Ponzi scheme with the gas industry, uh, yeah, there's an op-ed, I believe, in the New York Times talking about that. And, you know, the thing is about oil and gas markets is that they will fluctuate from time to time, and it's nice to read articles like that, but it, it shouldn't get a sense of comfort that the market will just lead to their demise. Um, the gas industry... There's a ton of cheap fracked gas right now on the market, and that is really why they're pushing to build export terminals on the coasts, Oregon, uh, New York, New Jersey. Our organization has been fighting them on that, on that front for uh, and very much right now on the East Coast, and, and I think there's some proposals in Oregon as well. They want to be able to export the fracked gas to, to overseas markets. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was uh, similarly, at one of the last things Obama did was lift the export ban on crude oil. Uh, because similarly, the oil industry wanted to do the same thing with the, all the glut of oil in this country. So, um, you know, our, our, our position on this is that we're not going to change things until we really, I mean, people, I don't think there's a magic incentive or a carrot. Or, the government actually just has to mandate that we're getting off of fossil fuels. It, it's it's got to be that blatant, that clear. And, that, and so we, we're excited when Tulsi Gabbard introduces legislation, the Off Fossil Fuels Act for a Better Future, now has about 45 co-sponsors in Congress, went from four to 45 this year. And this is no, it'll be government policy that we are transitioning off of fossil fuels, uh, doing the bulk of the work in the next 10 years, and by no later than 2035. That's what we want to do in every city and every state. So that, that, in my opinion, that is the only way. You can't do it with, with a, a, a money system. Um, I, I, um, I also wanted to say that in California, fracking is not the only form of oil and gas extraction happening. And in fact, what we're experiencing in LA and in, especially in South Central, it's not fracking. And so to um, Adam's point, any policy that happens needs to begin from a place of equity. And it needs to begin with protecting public health and uh, neighborhood resilience. Um, and, and just to let you know, in LA, our coalition, um, Stand Together Against Neighborhood Drilling, we're actually advocating for a motion for a 2,500 foot human health and buffer between um, oil extraction facilities and neighborhoods. So, you know, this, this is what we need to do. And while doing this, simultaneously advocating for strategies to, to make a just transition to a clean energy economy. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, I just wanted to um, add a little bit about the uh, fee and dividend. Um, and so I think we need multiple strategies in, to sort, solve the climate change issue. It's obviously one of the most um, uh, challenging, one of the, the greatest, greatest um, you know, uh, environmental um, crises of our time, and so I think we need multiple multiple strategies. And the just to, just to answer the the other question is that um, the carbon fee and dividend does not involve any type of uh, trade between entities, and there's zero offsets involved. But it just it but it raises the price of carbon. It makes the price of carbon, and therefore fossil fuels more expensive. And so the dividend allows for um, uh, some the revenue from that 
from the, the fee to go, in some cases, some have argued that it can go to all Americans um, equally. I mean, I would, I would argue that low-income communities and low-income communities that are most affected by the fee should, um, should, should receive a portion of that fee. And a portion of, of that fee should also, could also go toward um, some of these, these uh, forest communities. California um, imports a significant amount of its oil from places like Ecuador, like the Sarayaco community. So I think we have um, an important uh, um, responsibility to support some of those communities that are also not only protecting those forests, but are fighting to keep fossil fuels underground. And there's a significant amount of fossil fuels underground in that, that part of the Amazon. Um, and so these are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Thank you all so much for your wisdom. Um, I just wanted to make an observation and ask a question about this business of building a fund. And given that farmers have almost no access to land because land is real estate priced, and given the need for land trusts, right, I'm thinking that from a pan-California point of view, given that in 2008 all our community social benefit land trust county agencies basically lost all their funding, that we could regenerate that activity such that land trust money, which is almost always grown from a community base, it's a county-based entity, could begin to be a, a kind of umbrella, if you will, for funds that included what, Tracy, just what you suggested, even as an oversight, you know, I mean, maybe it's not funds from that place, but the people who were managing the fund could indeed include that in the goals of the fund. So I, the question is, in your work, do you see drivers for the growth of reinvigorating our county land trusts? Can, can we just get the all three questions? Because I know we're about to run out of time. So let's get all questions and do our best to answer some of them. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, cap and trade is alive and well in California forestry policy. And I'm from uh, rural Northern California, where Sierra Pacific, I believe is the largest landowner, private landowner in California, is really liking to clear cut and in looking at a timber harvest plan and writing about it and responding, there was, uh, evidently it's a boilerplate where clear cutting is claiming, they're claiming um, carbon credits for clear cutting because they say after 80 years, even aged forests uh, sequester more carbon. So it's such the industrial model. And it's just another example of how carbon trading is so easily gamed and such a whole different worldview. So thank you so much for your presentation. Hi, Tracy or others. Um, my question was around if, if you know of examples of industry like agriculture or otherwise taking cues from indigenous communities and learning from them. Um, or, or examples of places where government has mandated that that interaction and that shift take place. Who do you recommend to get gas from? Sorry, what? Who, who do you recommend to get gas from, like to fill up your car? <laughs> Anybody have an answer for that one? I don't have an answer for that one. No one's asked me that before, but yeah. next time I will. Okay. Um, so, um, a friend of mine uh, just bought um, a Prius, uh, sorry, not a Prius, um, a Tesla, because he, um, Akash, their 11-year-old son, they wanted to buy a, an electric vehicle, Akash, their 11-year-old son, um, did a, an amazing PowerPoint presentation of, like, the th of three electric vehicles, and, like, it, the, you know, the Tesla for him, I mean, he really wanted one, anyway. <laughs> they got one, but the point is, is that they also have solar on, solar, um, on their rooftop, rooftop solar. 
So it is, and those cars, I mean, well, I think the range now is like, what, 300 um, miles per, um, per charge. So the technology is starting to, to catch up. I mean, in some ways, I think it reminds me a little bit of, of uh, Miguel Altieri's um, discussion of agroecology. Like, how do we sort of draw on some of these indigenous ideas of, um, of balance and equilibrium and sustainability and marry it with the, the current technology? And I think that is an example. So, I mean, how, we don't fill up our cars with gasoline, but we, we get, have the policies, we, you know, there, there are government policies that allow us to put rooftop solar on our, on our house, houses to support communities, all communities, to be able to have rooftop solar. Um, we, are, we have the technology for now to have electric vehicles, and then there's no need for gasoline in our car. Yeah, I mean, as um, you heard earlier, I mean, LA had the biggest network of electric cars like what, 70 years ago, and uh, there's a great film, Who Killed the Electric Car? So, I mean, the technology is there. It's a question of political will. The, qu the point about the forest, I mean, that's another strike against the California's renewable portfolio standard, where currently burning dead trees is considered renewable energy in this state. So we gotta, we gotta clean that up, and we gotta clean up our government. Uh, also, for those of you who are gonna be around this week, there's gonna be a, a, a protest on all the things we're talking about Thursday morning and in front of the summit. There's gonna be some flyers in the back if you wanna come join us. Come talk to me in the back, some flyers in the back. I just wanna caution about being all excited about electric cars because there's a heavy duty mining cost. And the environmental cost with disposing of those things is, is nobody knows how to do it. And so I'm just saying, while they hold these panaceas out, if we look at indigenous communities, they're doing fine without cars and without electric cars.